So, good afternoon and welcome back. I'm not trying any Russian today. I was told off. I was, must have been really terrible yesterday. So today we will be talking about a revolution. This morning I was told that the Russian Revolution started on a square, not very, well, I don't know which direction, not very far from here, this direction, okay. So, and now, but this time it's a revolution that took place about 500 million years ago. So in prehistoric times, there is no eyewitness to this occasion, so we have room for a bit of speculation, but you will see that we can also underpin this argument with a lot of facts. And it has to do with the molecular nature of the immune system in jawless vertebrates. I forgot to put in a slide to indicate to you what you probably know, the evolutionary trajectory of chordates Coming off with Amphioxus, we talked about Amphioxus yesterday. Tunicates, a highly derived chordate group. And then the first true vertebrate, the jawless fishes. I'm not talking about all the ones that are extinct now. And then we come with the cartilaginous fish. And then the bony fish, the amphibians, the birds. And then, hopala, Lenny. So, the mammalian system will feature quite prominently later in the series, but today we will be talking about the jawless fishes. The jawless fishes emerged about, well, there's a, a bit of a debate, maybe 500, 550 million years ago, and very few of jawless vertebrates survive to this day, about a hundred different species, where we, whereas we have in the order of 50 or more thousand or 90,000 uh, species, different species of uh, jawed vertebrates, that is not uh, uh, gnatostomata. So, um, the Immunologists have been interested in jawless vertebrates for quite some time, so have been evolutionary biologists, because they seem to uh, exhibit primitive characters of the vertebrate body plan. So people were quite interested to see what the differences might be between them and the, the true uh, um, uh, jawed vertebrates. And so were immunologists, and they were trying to find out whether these creatures already had features in their immune response that would be similar to the one that we knew from, uh, uh, for example, mammals. So we knew, for example, when we immunize mammals, we can elicit a memory response. A second immunization gives a much faster and a much more prominent response. So there was certain features in our immune system that people sought to determine whether they also existed in, in jawless vertebrates. And there is a huge gap in terms of extant species between the tunicates and the jawless vertebrates. We don't quite know how much evolutionary time is between these groups, but a lot must have happened between tunicates and the appearance of the common vertebrate ancestor and the common vertebrate ancestor, who is no longer among us, and the first true vertebrate. And the way to find out what might have happened in this time that is now in the Dark Ages is to do <coughs> a comparison between features of Amphioxus, tunicates, and then jawless vertebrates and jawed vertebrates. So today we will be discussing jawless vertebrates and in the second part today cartilaginous fishes. And we'll also then move into a bit of the bony fishes. So cartilaginous fishes, uh, sorry, jawless vertebrates and jawless fishes already show, this is what I was referring to as the revolution, two cardinal features of our immune system. That is a special cell type that does not seem to exist outside the vertebrate kingdom, and that is the lymphocyte. And the other major in, uh, innovation that has proven to be 
uh, present in all vertebrates are lymphoid organs. And I'll come to the raison d'etre of lymphoid organs a little later. But to summarize, what I'm trying to explain to you today is these two innovations form the basis of cellular and humoral immunity in vertebrates. I explained to you yesterday that there is certain features of um, somatic diversification and other uh, principles that might well, one might uh, categorize under a an, an sort of proto-adaptive immune system. But here we are in the full-blown adaptation, innate, interaction, co-evolution, all these definitions we were trying to make yesterday apply to this system. So we have lymphocytes and we have lymphoid organs. And the story of immunology in vertebrates, in, in jawless vertebrates, started about a hundred years ago. And, and I read all very old papers where people were looking for lymphoid organs in these creatures or for aggregations of lymphoid-like cells that were described quite some time ago, but only more recently recognized as the true effector cells in the immune system. So it was perhaps no surprise that two grand old men, although old is of course the wrong name because they are still very much active, of, the, of immunology joint forces um, in the late 90s to reinvestigate the immune system of jawless vertebrates, that is lampreys. So Jan Klein and Max Cooper, about whom you must have read, because they, all, they appear in all textbooks, decided they wanted to use a very simple and very seemingly old-fashioned technique to see whether lamprey would have lymphocyte-like cells. And the experiment they did, or one of the experiments they did, was to extract cells from the intestine of lamprey larvae, because lamprey uh, spend most of their time as larvae, um, and they compared the light scatter characteristics, that is the size and the granularity of the cytoplasm of these cells that they could in, uh, extract from the typhlosol, which is a structure that is associated with the gut of the lamprey, with the light scatter profile of lymphocytes that they extracted from the mouse intestine. Assuming that a certain profile of size and granularity would be evolutionarily conserved if one looked at lymphocytes that were not stimulated. And I'll show you some more detailed pictures in a moment. But what they saw, they thought was quite encouraging. So he, you look here, this is the forward light scatter and the side scatter. And there is a, a group of cells that form a very dense cluster of cells, very much like cells that one could isolate and knew that they represented intestinal epithelial <coughs> lymphocytes. So they assumed there must be lymphocytes in lamprey. They then used the electron microscope, again a rather old-fashioned technique these days, but still very useful, to look at these cells at the ultrastructural level. And what you notice, and that is characteristic of all lymphocytes, there is very little cytoplasm surrounding the nucleus. And the nucleus has certain densities in the chromatin. And when you compare this, um, and, uh, this lymphocyte with this lymphocyte, you cannot really make up a clear difference. Again, arguing that the cells that were isolated from the lam lamprey typhlosol could potentially be lymphocytes. Now, if these ultrastructural features suggest that there are lymphocytes. There is one other cardinal feature of lymphocytes that is quite characteristic, and that is that these lymphocytes proliferate upon antigen antigenic stimulation. So, for example, if you stimulate a fly, and we talked about hemocytes yesterday, hemocytes are basically phagocytes of a special kind that patrol the coelom of, of flies, but when they are stimulated, and we know that we can stimulate them, they do not proliferate. 
So once these cells are formed in the adult body, whatever happens to it, they do not proliferate. However, lymphocytes, if they are activated by the right antigen or if they are activated by some polyclonal stimulus, for T cells, this is a mitogen that has been isolated and been used extensively, maybe somebody knows, phytohemagglutinin, PHA. It's a very non-specific stimulus for all lymphocytes, so when you expose them to PHA, they start proliferating. So it's a polyclonal activation, nothing to do with antigenic specificity, but all lymphocytes start proliferating. So they tested whether the same was true for lymphocytes in the lamprey, and indeed they found that cells would, upon stimulation by PHA, would stimulate would be stimulated and started to proliferate. And it's very easy to measure proliferation, of course, by incorporation of particular uh, uh, base, uh, nucleic, uh, nucleic acid base analogs. But there's also a phenotypic change when cells proliferate, and you can see that here. This is a bit further advanced, but I'm just illustrating this. An unstimulated lymphocyte, we've seen this small of a very narrow uh, um, a cytoplasm, a couple of mitochondria, a large nucleus relative to the entire cell body. Now this is a stimulated lymphocyte, PHA stimulated. The nucleus hasn't changed much in size, but the cell has. It's much bigger now. The cytoplasm is bigger, indicating some response. And we now know, of course, what that means. It's, of course, replication, but it's also changing the phenotype of the cell. They all of a sudden start making certain uh, uh, molecules. Now what was shown about 50 years ago in the, in the laboratory of Bob Good, where Max Cooper did his uh, PhD work, although he was originally a medic when he turned to science, was that Lamprey would reject skin grafts. And that was a rather unusual observation. And I show you the, the table here. The nomenclature is a bit awkward because we are now not uh, used to this nomenclature anymore. Autograph and homograph. Does anybody know what that means? When you read the old literature, so obviously there's a lot of confusion there. We now call this allogeneic and What's the other autologous transplants? Yeah. So let's, let's look at this. So they, they, you see, this is a very nice example of a, a cleverly designed experiment with fewer numbers, but with a very clear outcome. So when autocrafts were transplanted, there was never a rejection. Autograft simply meaning same tissue into a different place in the same animal. When they did a homograft, what we now would call allogeneic transplantation, there was rejection in nine out of nine cases. And you don't have to be mathematically inclined to think that this is a statistically significant um, result. So it seemed that Lamprey would have some individual signal that would allow them to di distinguish their, their, their autograft, same tissue, from some tissue that comes from another individual of the same species. So there was some indication that there was perhaps, and we know that um, a skin rejection is um, a sign of a functioning cellular immune system, so there was some indication already in the old literature, and of course Max Cooper knew about this, because of, he was in the lab at the time, but it couldn't be followed up for a number of reasons. So there was this old information that there was perhaps some sort of specificity in the immune system. And of course, if there is specificity, there needs to be a molecular basis for specificity. So in the early 2000s, Max reinvestigated this at the molecular level, uh, level, having shown that there are possibly lymphocytes. So if there are lymphocytes, if there is all this skin rejection, there might be specificity. And here I show you a humoral response. That is now from a paper where the first antigen receptor of Lamprey had been discovered, but ignore the names now. Simply look at what the 
serum of stimulated animals would give in testing titers. You see after four weeks stimulation a certain titer, the titer rapidly increasing and you, you dilute and you have evidence for a memory response. You can overstimulate when you repeatedly stimulate more and more of this enigmatic substance that would recognize a particular antigen, in this case cellular uh, components or cell wall components from two uh, bacillus anthracis and subtilis strains. So they are antigenically different, that is what we know, and you see there is some specificity here. When you immunize with this, the titer increases, but this does not. So that would indicate that there was something what was in the older literature described as immunoglobulins. Because people didn't, or antibody, people didn't quite know at the time what the structure of the antibody was, but there was some substance that could bind the antigenic um, stimulus. So that has been now put onto a molecular footing, and I'll explain to you what is known about this, and you will be, if you haven't followed the literature, be very surprised. We now know, and this, the latest installment has just been uh, published, we now know that Lamprey possesses three different kinds of lymphocytes. Not just one type, but three different kinds. And these lymphocytes express different types of antigen receptors. You are used to thinking of T-cell receptors and B-cell receptors or immunoglobulins or T-cell receptors and T-cell receptors in different forms, alpha, beta or gamma, delta. So we know that we have different lymphocyte lineages in uh, jaw vertebrates. But what was shown here is the same is true or a very similar situation exists in the lamprey. So here monoclonal antibodies were raised against three different types of these receptors termed A, B and C. And when you look at these flow cytometry profiles you see that when you look at, I think that is blood, you will see that there is a certain percentage of lymphocytes, that's blood lymphocytes, that react with this antibody against VLRA and there is a certain percentage against B and C and A and B and C and by this analysis you can show that there is mutual expression of these different forms of antigen receptors. And then you can look at the percentage of lymphocytes that are positive for these various receptors that changes from tissue to tissue, but that doesn't really matter here. What really matters is that there is evidence for some subcellular differentiation. Not only do we all of a sudden have lymphocytes, even in jawless vertebrates we have three different types of lymphocytes, perhaps even more, but at least three different types. Now let's summarize this and mirror this against what I put on the, on the blackboard. This is the situation in jawless vertebrates. We have, or we, we think we have, some hematopoietic progenitor that gives rise to a T-cell lineage and a B-cell lineage. We have one T-cell lineage that expresses this particular receptor type VLRA and another one that is called C, and I'll come to this in a moment, and there's another B-cell-like lineage that expresses VLRB. The B-cell-like lineage is defined by the fact that the antigen receptor, although originally surface-bound, is then secreted into the serum. Like B-cells in mammals have a B-cell receptor. Once the antigen binds to the B-cell receptor, activates the B-cell, the B-cell sheds the B-cell receptor, and we know the B-cell receptor that is in soluble form as antibody. And the same is true here, so this is why this is considered to be a B-like cell type, makes this particular isoform. So we are going from nothing to three different types of lymphocytes. And that is, seems a bit implausible. So then you sit down and use your scrap paper and think of perhaps that the common vertebrate ancestor might have had one T-like cell and one B-like cell that was then 
this at least was diversified into two different types of T cells and perhaps even before, maybe in the transition period between chordates and this common vertebrate ancestor, there might have been a situation where there was only a single type of lymphocytes. So I would like you to remember at least vaguely this particular scheme because something hidden here and I will reveal this a bit later. So from many lineages, two different types, a, a cell type where the, the antigen receptor is always membrane bound, is never secreted, and a cell like and a cell where the where the that the antigen receptor can be secreted, so a T or a B-like cell, and then maybe some sort of oral lymphocyte. And people, of course, want to know. You might as well. What is the oral lymphocyte like? Is it a T? or a bee-like. And you can have uh, discussions that uh, emulate religious wars when you argue either B or T first. I'm quite fond of T-cells, so I'm always opting for the T-cell being the first important um, lymphocyte type. Others who like B-cells more, of course, think it's the B-cell. Can it be something different from DMT? for example. What's the definition of lymphocytes? Well, he's our, he has our diplomat. He can, yes, that conflict can be resolved by saying maybe it wasn't either B or T, it was some, maybe that is then the right name, or lymphocyte. Okay. But what's the definition, what's the uh, definition of lymphocytes, except there's the cells that res respond to mitogen and have large nucleus and small cytoplasm? Well, that's the definition. That's an operational yeah. definition. We will never know whether this is of the same physiology because we can't test it. This is why I'm saying it's a lot, now it's speculation, okay? This is why it's always question marks here. Okay, so what do these antigen receptors of lamprey look like? And this was a very, very big surprise. And that has a lot of ramifications in thinking about the origin of this system. Because it turned out that these antigen receptors do not belong to what we refer to as the immunoglobulin superfamily. Immunoglobulin superfamily is defined by a particular protein domain about 100 amino acid long that is characterized by a one disulfide bridge that gives the, this domain a certain overall structure. And that is called immunoglobulin superfamily fold or immunoglobulin domain. And the expectation, of course, was because the T cell receptor and the B cell receptor have this fold, that the antigen receptors in the lamprey would have a similar structure. But the surprise was that's not at all true because these antigen receptors are made up of leucine rich repeats. Now, leucine rich repeats were known before that discovery to be part of a number of receptors in that function in many different contexts. But one context also is immunity. For example, many plant receptors that recognize um, certain pathogens when plants respond to infection are composed of leucine-rich repeats. And we mentioned yesterday one receptor, <coughs> the toll-like receptors, they also have leucine-rich repeats. It's a very versatile 24 amino acid domain that folds independently has many leucines, this is why, where the name comes from, and the leucines, of course, stabilize the, the structure. And these leucine-rich repeats are by themselves in repeated form, an array of leucine-rich repeats then make up this particular receptor. And what is really interesting is because of the molecular nature of this repeat, when you put one after the other in a row of leucine-rich repeats, this always forms like a horseshoe, and you can see that here. So it has a convex and a concave side, and in the few structures that were made when these receptors were crystallized for structural analysis in complex with their antigen, so when they were purified in vitro and then complexed with the cognate antigen that one had identified, it was found that the antigen binds in the concave, on the concave surface. So when you turn this round here, you can see that here, 
Then, of course, you can recognize beta strands here. So it's a very rigid, repeated structure that is capped at both ends. But in between, the number of loose and rich repeats can be quite variable. And that is actually very neat when you think about it. When you extend the number here, it goes from this to this because it becomes longer and then the ends come further together. So you obviously can't go as far as to close the circle, but you can have a variety of, of loose and rich repeats and then you can accommodate quite a different uh, shape of potential antigens that then can interact with the surface in here. And interestingly enough, certainly for this VLRB uh, molecule, this loop that extends from here also makes contact to antigen, at least, as I said, in the very few structures that have been done. So there is, of course, again, the recurrent theme. Antigen has a certain molecular surface that interacts with the molecular surface of this antigen receptor. But the surprise was it's not immunoglobulin folds or domains, it's leucine rich repeats. Now, what does that mean? It means that the antigen receptors of jawless vertebrates and the antigen receptors of jawed vertebrates have a different origin. They cannot be the same because they are structurally different. Now this in itself is a huge surprise because it must mean that there was some, whatever you would like to call it, some evolutionary pressure or selection pressure to use these particular type of antigen receptors on lymphocytes and jawless vertebrates went for the loose enriched repeats for reasons that we don't know and the jawed vertebrates went for immunoglobulin superfamily members. And that will be a bit clearer in a moment. Now here is the logic of assembling the loose enriched repeat receptors. Because I talked to you about the toll-like receptors. The toll-like receptors are germline encoded they are expressed, wherever they express, they all have, all have the same structure and they are under Darwinian selection. Now these variable leucine, uh, variable leucine, no, variable lymphocyte receptors that were discovered in lamprey are somatically diversifying. Another surprise. So now we have lymphocytes here and there, jawless, jawed. But we have different molecular types of receptors, but there is a, again a commonality they somatically diversify. So how do they do this? They do it by gene conversion. It was found, I'll show you the details a bit later, but I'll give you the schematic beforehand, otherwise you will be a little bit confused. So here is the constant region that encodes the 5 prime end and the 3 prime end of the molecule. 5 prime, 3 prime. And I told you this middle bit is variable. The middle bit is encoded in individual module, modules, LRR, 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 LRR. And now gene conversion is used to bring these individual modules in variable numbers, in variable order, into this incomplete constant locus to make a complete VLR gene. So it's either one of these modules or two or three or four or five or six and I'll come to this in a moment. Gene conversion means that the donor sequence is not altered and we will discuss how the assembly of the T-cell receptors and immunoglobulins occurs and this is quite different. So gene conversion simply means you make a copy of this, you put it here, but this still remains. Okay, so it's not changed. And it was found that these LRR complexes are outside of this, but near this constant region locus. And this is how it works. So here is a bit more detail, but you don't have to look at the detail. You simply have to appreciate these different colors so down here is a list of, or a schematic of these germline loci. You see the blue end, this is the N-terminus, 
and the red end, that is the C terminus, and then you have all these shades of green that are the bits that are in between. Now this gene conversion can only work, of course, if there is some sequence homology, because otherwise the gene conversion does not know where to go. So there has to be a bit of sequence similarity between this end here and the incoming sequence. And because then the incoming sequence brings a bit of sequence homology that another element can recognize, you can bit by bit build this molecule. And you can do this from either end. You can go from here until you hit the constant region, or you can build it from here until you hit the constant region. Can you go both sides? Um, I'll show you an exa a real-life example. This is, of course, the schematic. I'll come to this in a bit later. So this is what the locus for the VLRC gene looks like. They're all basically the same. So don't look at the details, just look at the color. So up here is a schematic of a matorophan, N-terminal blue, C-terminal red, the green bits in between, and now you can see this. The green bits are located in strings of these elements. Sometimes they have something attached to them that is reminiscent of this here. This is basically the sequence homology. So this bit, for example, would then go here, extend it a bit to the left with the green bit, because that is the germline locus. The germline locus doesn't have anything green. And this green then can recognize perhaps this green, and this green recognizes this one, or maybe this one, and then in this way you build up the complete, the complete gene. They're very complicated loci, but the gene conversion process then means that you have variability, not only in sequence, but also in order and number. That is what we call somatic diversification. Now let, let's look at this in a bit more detail in a moment. I can skip that one. I can skip that one as well. Now coming back to these different lymphocyte types, what was demonstrated by simply looking at a subset of genes, basically cherry-picked, from homologs that one had identified from genes that were known to play a role in the mammalian system and asking is this gene or homolog of it, perhaps even an orpholog, present in the lamprey? So are these common genes? And then some of them could be identified again. This is not to be read. And then one looks at the expression level of these genes in these individual subsets. I showed, I showed you we have VLRA, we have VLRC, VLRB, these two Ts this one B cell lineage, and you can see that there is a block of red genes, mostly here, not so much here, but certainly not here. Here's a block of gene, mostly here, a little bit of that here, but not much here, and there is a block of genes here. Red means highly expressed in the Bs, but not in the Ts. Indicating that this gene expression profile sort of suggests, also at the molecular level, that these lymphocytes might have a different identity. So these genes are all related to the immunity? Did I yeah. see some interleukins, but all the Yeah, some of them. Well, it's, it's not always very clear, but in, in, in general one could say this is true, yes. Some genes have more than one function. And actually, if we're not going to come back to the conversion, uh, I might have a question. So the original set of this, you know, the, the color cubes from the, which the somatical uh, the receptors combine, that is inherited, and that is under the Darwinian evolution pressure, right? The yeah. original set of the... Yes. Okay. But I'll come to this, I'll show you the, a, a bit more precisely. So now, just to remind you, I've, I've showed you this picture here. So we have these two different T-cell types, and what was interesting was that the, 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 the distribution of these cells in different tissues is different. Now I realize now, and you can't see that well. Now there is color code. The VLRAs are red, the VLRCs are green in this immunofluorescence. Now, now looking at different tissues and asking where do these cells locate to, and one finds that preferentially the green cells 
Uh, you can see that here in the summary, if you, don't, if you can't see this well, uh, mostly in the epidermis, also a bit more prominent in the intestinal epithelium, as if these cells like to sit in mucosal tissues. And the red cells, the VLIA plus cells, the other type of T cell, is a bit more evenly distributed. That would indicate that there is a certain tissue tropism that is different between these two different cell types, and that is reminiscent of the different tropism of different types of T cells that we see in mammals. Certainly indicating that the function of these cells might be different, because when they are locating into different tissues, that might mean something in functional terms. And of course, it's very difficult to study this in lamprey, so there is a lot more work to be done on this. Now, one interesting aspect, and this is, not, this is basically not uh, our work, that was uh, work that was done in Max Cooper's laboratory, but one interesting aspect that came from this gene expression analysis, which you, of course, did not notice because you could not read because it was too small, but now I'm pointing it out to you. This arrow here points to a gene that has a very inconspicuous name that's called CDA1 cited in the aminase 1. And yesterday we discussed in mollusks that there is a phenomenon that is called hypermutation or can be related to hypermutation. And hypermutation is a very efficient way of somatically diversifying antibodies in mammals and in other jawed vertebrates. And somatic diversification is a key element, for example, and I'll come to this in passing, for example, in chicken to make the antibody repertoire. So, Somatic diversification and gene conversion are very important also in the jawed vertebrate immune system, but it's absolutely essential in the, the immune system of jawless vertebrates. And it turned out, when you look at the expression here, this is the control here, so there is red, red, blue. And there is another of these CDA genes. Again, you cannot see this, but it's, uh, even I can't see it now. There it is, CDA2, blue, blue, red. So reciprocal expression of CDA1 cited in the aminase 1 and another cited in the aminase number 2, mostly in these B-like cells. And that rang a bell because it's known that, that uh, cited in the aminases are imported in uh, gene conversion in a number of different contexts. And it suggested the possibility that perhaps this gene is involved in the assembly of the VLR genes that we just discussed. So I showed you that VLRA, VLRC and VLRB are incomplete loci. They have to bring in elements, these leucine rich repeats, to make mature genes of different lengths. And this process has to be catalyzed because it's not happening anywhere else in the body except in lymphocytes in lamprey. So this is a lymphocyte-specific expression of these cited in the aminases, and they probably target this locus and then assemble the genes. But from a practical point of view, you might say, okay, if a lymphocyte starts to assemble its VLR genes, this lymphocyte is probably a young one, a lymphocyte in development. And if a lymphocyte is in development, perhaps that could mark the site in the body where these lymphocytes mature. You all know, of course, that lymphos the T cells in the mammals, or in, indeed in jawed vertebrates, develop and mature in the thymus, a very special organ, a lymphoid organ. The B cells develop in the bone marrow in mammals, in where, where does that happen in chicken? In the birth of Fabricius, yes, in a different place. And what does that immediately suggest? B cells are not very demanding. B cells can develop almost anywhere. Wherever there is hematopoiesis, B cells can develop. So, for example, if you are an unfortunate patient suffering from osteopetrosis, where there is no bone marrow cavity, and you can't have a bone marrow because the, the bones are basically rock solid, there has to be hematopoiesis elsewhere. And one possibility is 
to have hematopoiesis, for example, in the liver, like during the fetal period. You can have hematopoiesis in the brain. You can have it in the lung. You can, ha can have it almost anywhere. Hematopoiesis and B cell development are not very demanding. They just need a couple of factors that can be produced almost anywhere. But T cells are very, very picky. They are really posh. They are the posh type of lymphocytes, and they want to have a very special environment, and that is always the thymus. Now, the question then was, if that is really true, and we have so many similarities, perhaps lamprey also have a thymus. That, of course, was not known when we entered into this problem. In fact, we've been studying this for quite some time, but we obviously always made the wrong experiments. But until we were led into the right direction or pointed in the right direction by Max Cooper's findings. And then we used expression patterns of this CDA1 gene, seemingly associated with the maturation of the T-like cells in lamprey, to find a tissue where this uh, maturation might occur. And what we found to our big surprise was that the thymopoietic or T cell supporting, T cell development supporting tissue is situated in lampreys in the gill region. That is perhaps not a surprise because the thymus is always associated with the pharyngeal region. But the expression of CDA1 was confined to the terminal aspects of these gill filaments that one sees in lamprey larvae. And when you look at this in a normal H&E stain, hematoxyl and eosin stain, this, if I had pointed out to you that this is the thymopoietic tissue in lamprey larvae, you probably would have gone away smiling. Okay. I wouldn't believe that, and I wouldn't have believed it either. And many people have studied this, and indeed I went back to the literature when that paper was published, or for this paper to be published, and I had to write a synopsis, a history of famous research in lamprey. It was very fascinating, I have to say, and the key indications were in papers that were delivered to the Imperial Academy of Sciences, not in St. Petersburg, but in Vienna, so in the, uh, in, the, in the 19th century, and people were already then studying and looking at agglomerations of lymphocytes. They, of course, they pointed into the wrong direction because they could not imagine that this might have happened there because it's very in, inconspicuous, and of course they did not have all these molecular tools that we now have. But nonetheless, this is an issue that was around for about 150 years and could only be, sol be solved after these uh, genetic indications came to light. But that is also very, in terms of morphology, this is very different from what we are used to when we look at the thymus in jaw vertebrates. So even I still have a thymus, although it's very small. You have, still have a thymus, and infants, of course, have a very big one, because where the T cell development has the highest rate, but then, of course, it shrinks over time in, in age. But it's one solid piece of tissue. It's not dispersed, although there are some exceptions, but in principle it's a large piece of tissue. But in the lamprey, and this is my, my artist's impression of the situation of the, um, of the gill basket of the lamprey, you have these gill filaments coming out of the gill basket, and at the top of these gill filaments is this thymopoietic tissue, which we termed thymoid, thymus-like. And what is interesting is that when you look at the status of the VLR genes in this particular region, you can cut that away by special means and then look at the structure of these VLR genes, you find that they are mostly incomplete. So as if this is an ongoing process and some cells make it, they make a proper assembly and some cells don't and then perhaps die. So the ongoing process of assembly is highest in terms of molecular indications in this particular thymoid region. This is now a picture of where we took the tissue from. Now here comes the real life snapshots. We never managed to get a piece of DNA that would connect the two ends together 
in incomplete form. So I showed you the schematic before, now this is real life here. So here, this is our germline locus. You see the blue bit, so here the first element comes in from here, extends it to the blue end or light blue end, but of course it connects it to here, but it in the process deletes this bit, then it adds a bit more, and then the internal elements are coming, are coming, are coming, but it stops here in terms of structure that we could find. Or else you begin at the other end and you build these yellow things with this end, of course, in incomplete form. But we never could see something that had a gap in between. So something that was coming from the right and coming from the left, but not quite finished. That probably means that these elements are very rare and were not uh, easy to identify. But these incomplete assemblies were happily isolated from this thymoid region, indicating indeed that this is the, the site of assembly for these, um, for these genes. So uh, can we do it artificially? Can we do it? Can we do it artificially to assemble some sequence uh, that will be, have the gap in between? And what would be the, would be the purpose of doing this? Mm, just to see if it can happen. <laughs> well, artificially we can do almost anything. The, the key experiment would be to put this back into the lamprey and see whether that could be used to be completed. Yeah, right. Yeah, but I, can, I have to disappoint you. This is a bit difficult with lamprey. Lamprey has a generation time in the order of plus minus 10 years. So it's not a PhD student's project. It's not even for a PI. You, you get to the F3 stage and you are retired before you do the proper experiment. So that is a little difficult to do. But as an interim summary, I would like to say that we've now seen some extraordinary similarities and dissimilarities between the immune system in jawed vertebrates, that is, we take as an example mammals, and these jawless vertebrates. So we have lymphocytes, we have even different lymphocyte lineages, we have different types of antigen receptors associated with different lymphocyte lineages. That is similar. We have a lymphoid organ for T cells, a thymus-like organ that is also similar. We have a typhlosol that many people consider to be the equivalent of the bone marrow in lamprey also similar where these VLRB cells develop. And, and that is the big difference, we have totally different structures of antigen receptors. So that must mean that they have a different origin. Now, there is more similarities and then it becomes really interesting after the break in a few moments. Let's look at the details of the modular assembly. I told you that the gene conversion requires sequence homology, if not identity, to bring these elements together. Otherwise they cannot pair and cannot build this tiling path. This is here indicated just again in color, not to read the, this is amino acids here. Now this is the initial, the germline part. First bit from the outside comes. Next bit from the outside comes next bit, next bit, next bit, until we're done. And this you might be able to read. This overlap region here, leucine, proline, valine, is in, I mean, in, in nucleotide sequence completely identical. Leucine, lysine, serine, leucine, identical, save a few differences. And the same is true for here and for here. So this is evidence of this microhomology that directs the gene conversion. That's all very well. This is what we would expect. And if the sequence is identical in terms of amino acids, then we would not worry because it simply means that the end of this one is the same to the beginning of this one and when we patch them together the sequence does not change. So this sequence would be the same both in the germline and in the assembled form. This is his answering his question. Is there identity between assembly and the primordial versions, the building blocks? 
Yes, there is, when we look at this example. And that means that these building blocks can be um, put under Darwinian selection. So we can really modify these building blocks. And if they, for example, have a couple of leucines missing, then they would not form the leucine rich repeat structure and they probably would be selected against. But it's unfortunately not that simple. And that has consequences. So now again, this is a little difficult to read, but this gives you now incomplete sequence and incoming sequence compared, uh, and yeah, incoming sequence and then compared against the net result. And the trouble here is that there are sometimes amino acid changes. Because you know, of course, each amino acid has a number of different codons. And there are some changes tolerated in this gene conversion process. And you can then very easily change one amino acid for the other. And all of a sudden, we have a sequence in protein that is neither in the original versions. So we are creating a new sequence at a junction. And that, of course, is a big problem. It's not like introducing new information in terms of longer amino acid sequence or short amino acid sequence. It's simply making these microscopic changes in the amino acid composition. But nonetheless, because these LRR elements are in the middle, and those are the ones that contact antigen, potentially, this might change then the desired antigen specificity. So not only is there combinatorial diversity, there is also junctional diversity of a special kind. It's not very prominent, but it's present. So we have to think about this. And when we now try to estimate the repertoire of lymphocytes and compare it against the repertoire of VLR sequences or different VLR sequences, we will find the following. We can easily make or estimate from the sequences that we have from these um, uh, lymphocytes that there are in the order of 10 to the power of 14 different VLR sequences. Now think of what that means. If we, that would require 10 to the power of 14 lymphocytes to express all of these receptors. And clearly, the lamprey does not have so many lymphocytes to represent the entire theoretical repertoire. The same is actually true for mammalian lymphocytes. And because we have so much possibility, it's a bit like a lottery. The German state lottery gives you one in a 120 million chance of hitting the jackpot. I missed it last week. <laughs> I always gamble when there is the jackpot above 20 million. It was last week, but I, I missed it. Well, no surprise, because I had only one chance out of 120 million. And here we have one in 10 to the 14, and we don't have so many lymphocytes. That in itself means that the repertoire of antigen receptors in terms of sequence diversity is different in each animal. And it is also true for mice. You think you do a very nicely controlled experiment when you use genetically identical mice. Yeah? So we make big efforts that we have pure C57 black 6 mice or bulb C mice or this or that or the other. And that's true, they are genetically identical. The trouble is that somatic diversification is so amazingly efficient that each animal has a different repertoire, or at least potentially has a different repertoire. So by necessity, there must be a biological variation when we assess the function of the immune system. So you must never forget this when you do an immunological experiment. So doing an experiment with one mouse is of no use, because you have to cover a relatively broad spectrum in order to see what the general response is like to a certain antigen, because you have to cover a certain percentage of this vastly diverse repertoire of things. But maybe some pieces are redundant, can it be? That is also true. It's not true. Well, this is what I didn't say, just to make it more traumatic. I would have uh, resolved that a bit later, but now I can say it. This is based on nucleotide. 
It's not based on amino acid. And of course, there's redundancy in the, in the genetic code, so it's not quite as bad in terms of protein, but still bad enough in terms of representing the entire possibilities in the repertoire. But he is right, if a certain molecular structure or surface of different amino acid primary sequence recognizes in, in three dimensions then the same antigen, of course there is redundancy also in the protein code binding to the same antigen. And that of course reduces the effective repertoire in recognizing antigens. That is certainly also true, but nonetheless the numbers are really staggering. And it's always possible that the uh, repertoire, entire repertoire is not represented in each individual. Now, as I alluded to in the yesterday, extraordinary, extraordinary diversity in antigen receptors engenders the problem of self-reactivity. Because if we cannot precisely predict what the structure of an antigen receptor is, it cannot, and if it's done in the soma, like here, we cannot apply Darwinian selection. We have to find ways of dealing with this in the soma. So we use the advantage of making many, many different receptors from a very small subset of genetic material, but then we have to deal with the problem of weeding out potential self-reactivity, and that is very important. Or at least we have to find a balance between the degree of self-reactivity and the recognition of non-self. <coughs> 